but how, how crappy would that be to exit from the tournament early and you look back and you guys all know that the reason that happened is because you didn't do everything in your power. See, there's only two things in this world that each of you has 100% control over 100% of the time. There's only two, your effort and your attitude. Those are the only two things you control all of the time. See some guys sweaty, you just put in some work? Optional work, or did you have to come in and work? And, and any time it's optional, is that the option you choose? Is it a yes or a no, right? Yeah, any time you have an option to get better, you make sure you take it. And there's not going to be any shortage of opportunities for you to get better. Um, you know, I, first and foremost, I want to make sure you guys realize how fortunate you are to be in the position that you're in. Um, you more than likely won't realize how fortunate you are until 10, 15 years having been removed from here. Uh, but I've been a fan and following Coach Hurley for a long time. Uh, and the staff and the opportunity that you guys here, have here is amazing. Um, I have the humility to know there's a very good chance I'm not going to say a single thing to you guys today that you don't already know and you haven't already heard. But I've been around the best players and coaches in the world for most of my life. And I realize that there's always going to be a difference between what you know and what you do. And if you guys want to be the best players that you're capable of, and you want to be the best team that you're capable of, each of you has to work every single day to close that gap between what you know and what you do. Think about it right now. If you came in every single day, not when you want to, not when you feel like it, not when it's convenient, you came in every single day and you made, not take, we don't need shot takers, there's plenty of those. We need shot makers here. And if you want to play at the next level, you've got to be a shot maker. But if you came in every day and you made 500 shots, but not just random shots, game shots from game spots at game speed, according to where you're supposed to shoot from, because not every single one of you is supposed to shoot from the exact same places. If you came in every single day, made 500 shots from game spots at game speed, what would be the result of that? Would you be a better shooter? Guaranteed. Would you be a better player? Would you be more valuable here at UConn? Would you increase or decrease your chance of playing professionally after? So the positives completely outweigh. I don't think there's a single negative that could be from doing that. And every single one of you knows that. I didn't see anybody's head explode. You guys all know that if you choose to come in and put in extra work and give your best effort, if you do that consistently, you know all of the positives that will happen then the only question you have to ask is, are you doing that? And are you doing it every single day? See, I don't know you guys. We met a few years ago, but we don't even know each other that well. I don't know you guys, but I can look at any team and pretty much guarantee there's a couple of you guys that aren't doing that. There's a good portion of you guys that do that when you feel like it, when it's convenient, and when you want to. Maybe there's one guy on the team that does that every single day. But that's what I'm talking about, closing that gap. Because it's not from lack of knowledge. Every one of you knows that you're supposed to do that. Every one of you knows you have an opportunity to do that. Every one of you knows what will happen if you do that. So then the question is, why are you not doing that every single day? And that's why I'm here today. I want to just give you guys some things to think about to do two things. One, for each of you to become the best version of yourself. That needs to be the first commitment that you make. You have to work to become the best version of yourself in everything that you do. Because you've signed up to be a part of something that's much bigger than you. Much bigger than you. And you owe it to everybody in this room to become the best version of yourself. And it can't be something that you, you choose to compartmentalize. It can't be, well, I'm going to be the best today because I feel like it. Or I'm going to be the best on the court, but I'm not going to really worry about the stuff off the court. You, that switch has to be on to be the best version of yourself. And then you guys need to collectively do that. See, the only way you can become the best team possible is if each and every one of you makes that decision. And you make that decision every single day. If half of you make that decision, half of you won't, you'll probably still be pretty good, but you won't be anywhere close to what you're capable of. And the other point that I will hammer home is that it's gonna be up to you guys to police each other. See, good organizations have what's called vertical accountability. 
That means these guys sitting behind you with the polo shirts on, they tell you what to do and you guys do it. That's vertical accountability. That's mediocre at best. If you all want to be championship contenders, you have to have horizontal accountability, which means you get on him when he's not doing what he's supposed to do. He gets on you when you're not doing what you're supposed to do. That when there's an optional workout, it's not really optional because you go bang on every single person's door and say, hey, we've got a workout coming up. Why are you not ready? Why are you not dressed? Why did you not come to the optional workout yesterday, man? You're killing, what, like we need you to be there for us to be good. When that comes from you guys and doesn't have to come from the top down, then you'll have created something special. And, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll get into some, some more depth with this stuff. One of the most valuable skill sets that you can have in any walk of life, but absolutely in basketball, is the ability to make other people better. And ultimately, that's a roundabout way of, of defining the word leadership. Like if your mere presence, if the moment you walk in this room, everyone in this room gets better just by the fact that you're here, that is like bottled gold. There's not an organization in the world that won't pay you guys millions of dollars because you make everyone around you better. And the only way you can do that is by being the best version of yourself. And, and you can program yourself to do these things every single day. And when you've made the commitment to do them every day, and you've got guys next to you that care enough about you and care enough about this program that they hold you to that standard and they don't let you slide, now you've got something special. Because it's human nature. There are going to be days where you don't feel like giving 100%. That's just human nature. That's not a knock on you. That's human nature. The question is, do the rest of you rally around next man up and encourage and push and empower him on the day he doesn't feel like it? Because inevitably, there's going to be a day where you don't feel like it either. And you need to count on these guys to be able to do the same thing for you. And notice all of the stuff we've just talked about doesn't have anything to do with your talent on the court. None. Now, thankfully, you guys have talent. You guys can play or you wouldn't be at UConn. But the talent is almost irrelevant if you're not going to actualize all of the stuff that you have control over. And it's in everything that you do. It's in your individual workouts. It's in your film sessions. It's in your weight room. It's every single thing that you do. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. And it's any time that you believe that you can compartmentalize excellence and you can compartmentalize greatness, that's when you're going to get beat. That's when it's going to catch you. Can you be a really good basketball player and give a poor effort in the classroom? Yeah, you can. I've seen plenty of guys do it. Can you be the best player that you're capable of and give a poor effort in the classroom? I don't think that you can because I think it has to be habitual. I think either you give everything you do, everything you have, or you don't. And I want to encourage you guys to consistently make the choice to do that. But on the days when you choose not to, you've insulated yourself with the guys that care enough about you and care enough about this program that they won't let you slide. So you have to realize, is it, is it hard playing for Coach Hurley? Does he get on you a little bit? He's tough, right? He comes from a tough background. He's a tough guy. But you guys have to realize that when someone holds you accountable, it means they care about you. That's the one thing you have to flip because a lot of people get that twisted. The reason people hold you accountable, whether it's the coaching staff here or it's the guy sitting next to you, it's because they care about you and they care about this program. See, if I know you're capable of more and I let you slide, that means I don't care. So you should be thankful to have someone or a group of someone's that watch your every move and are on you every second of every day. That you give 100% 99 times and on the 100th time when you choose not to, that's the day they bust your chops. You should be thankful for that. Because holding someone accountable, it's not something you do to them. It's something you do for them. And that's why you have to be able to create that mindset. You have to, because if, if you're dogging it in practice one day, Coach Hurley should be the last person that has to say something to you. Because the four or five guys right around you should say something to you before he even has to open his mouth. And when you guys can get to that point where you are a, a player-led team, not a coach-led team, then you'll be something really special. But you do have an amazing coaching staff, amazing head coach. But it's still going to have to come from you guys. Because especially in a game like basketball, they can't suit up and go out there and put in the work for you. It's always going to fall on you guys. So you have to make sure that you take that type of responsibility. And in order to do that, I want to make sure that you guys realize you can't ever leave the foundational base. 
it was back in 2007, which I know at that time you guys were pretty young, but I was kind of just starting in my coaching career, and uh, Nike flew me out to Los Angeles to do their Nike Skills Academies. You guys, have some of you guys gone through the Skills Academies? Nike stuff when you are in high school? Yeah, well, 2007 was the first year they decided to do them, and the very first one they did was with Kobe. And we can have a debate after my talk if you want, but in 2007, Kobe was the best player in the game. I mean, Jordan had already retired. You can make all the faces you want, Josh. It's a fact. And LeBron, as great as he was, he wasn't there yet, not in 2007. I mean, Kobe was that dude. And, and like you guys, basketball has always been my number one passion. So I, I had always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts were. And you guys have probably heard he called them blackouts. He didn't even call them workouts because he went so hard. Well, I was in the training space, so the thought of being able to maybe see one of Kobe's workouts got me pretty jacked up, and I, I asked him if I could watch one, and he was really gracious. He was very open, and he said, sure, man, I'm, I'm going tomorrow at 4. And probably like you guys, I got a little bit confused because the first workout with the players was the next afternoon at 3.30, and, and Kobe recognized that confused look on my face and was like, no, that's 4 a.m. Yeah. Well, you guys know there's not a legitimate excuse in the world on why you can't be somewhere at 4 in the morning. I know there's other things y'all would rather be doing at four in the morning, but they're not a legitimate <laughs> excuse, at least not something that you could tell Kobe Bryant. So I'd committed myself to being there, and, and I wanted to impress him, because I wanted to show Kobe how serious of a trainer I was, so I decided I was going to beat him to the gym. So I set my alarm for 3 a.m., and the alarm goes off, I jump up, I get dressed, and I hop in a taxi, and I head to the gym, and I, I get out of the taxi. It's 3.30 in the morning. I mean, it's pitch black outside, and yet the moment I step out of the taxi, I can already see the gym lights on. Even from the parking lot, I can hear a ball bouncing and sneakers squeaking. I walk in the side door at 3.30 in the morning, Kobe's already in a full sweat. He was going through a warm-up before his scheduled workout started at 4. Now, I didn't say anything to him, just out of professional courtesy, I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. Because for the first 45 minutes, I watched the best player in the world do the most basic footwork in offensive moves. Kobe was doing stuff I guaranteed you guys learned when you were in middle school. Now, this is Kobe Bryant. So he was doing everything at an unparalleled level of intensity. And he was doing everything with surgical precision. But the actual drills and footwork he was doing was incredibly basic. Now, his workout did last several hours. And when it was over, I didn't say anything to him again. And I, I just left. But my curiosity got the best of me. And I had to know. So later that day, I walked up to him and asked, and, and, and asked and said, Kobe, you're the best player in the world. You know, why are you doing such basic drills? And he smiled, that, that famous smile he has, and he said, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. I never get bored with the basics. Kobe Bryant, the best player in the world at that time, and someone who unquestionably has mastered his craft, said his secret is in the fact that he never gets bored with the basics. And as a young coach, that taught me a very pivotal lesson. And the lesson is just because something is basic, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Those aren't synonyms, but lots of times people use those words interchangeably. And, and I know now that we live in a society, and you guys live in a culture that often tells you it's OK to skip steps. They tell you to look for shortcuts. They tell you to circumvent the process. They tell you to chase what's hot and what's flashy, what's new and what's sexy. But I'm telling you guys, the basics work. They always have and they always will. And in order for you guys to each build the foundation to be the best player that you're capable of, individually and collectively, so you can win a national title and then go on and make millions of dollars playing this game, you can't leave the basics. You have to continue to master the basics. And you'll always be able to level up. But the basics are which the foundation to which the rest of the house is built. And in the game of basketball, clearly the basics. We're talking about footwork. We're talking about shooting mechanics. We're talking about passing angles and basketball IQ. We can't ever leave that. But then I want you guys to be able to look in other areas, like leadership, like teamwork, like being a good teammate. Th think about the best teammate you've ever had in your life. Well, it could be the guy sitting next to you right now, or it might be someone you played AAU with when you're in high school. What are the traits of the best teammates you've ever played with? This is the part where you guys speak. Think about it. What are the traits of the best teammates? They work hard. Absolutely. Humble. They're humble. Accountable. Accountable. Confident. Confident. They're leaders. 
I want you guys to think hard about what you just said because you guys nailed it. Think of the traits of the best teammates you've ever played with. And then ask yourself, are those the things that you do yourself every single day? Are you the type of teammate that you'd want to play with? Are you the type of player that if you were a coach, you'd want to coach? Those are the basics. That's the stuff that you have to do every single day. Because all of these things matter. How many of you want to play basketball when you leave UConn? You want someone to pay you a lot of money to play basketball. See, at this level, it's always going to be every single one of you, which is great. And you guys have the talent to make that happen. Each one of you already has the keys to the car. You have the talent to make it happen. You have the, the, the coaching staff and the support and the facilities and the resources to make that happen. The only person that's going to prevent that from happening is you. That's the only person. Now, you can easily blame other people and blame situations and blame circumstances and make excuses. You can do that all if you want. But the only person that can get in the way from you having what it is that you want to have is you. And you've got people that care enough about you to give you the blueprint of what you need to do to actualize that. And now it's completely up to you guys to make sure that you do that. And it's all going to start with the basics. You can't ever leave them. And there's... When we look at the basics, there's, there's three relationships that I want to make sure you guys are crystal clear on. And if you can actualize these three relationships, that will put you in the upper 1% of doing what it is that you guys want to do. The first I started with is the relationship you have with yourself. Do you have self-awareness? Do you have self-discipline? Do you have self-acceptance? Do you know what things you do well and what things you don't do well, both on the court and off the court, for the most part. Now, you wouldn't be able to play at this level. I mean, you guys are at a, a prominent powerhouse of a school. You wouldn't be able to play at this level if you weren't really good basketball players. You guys can do a lot of things well. But I guarantee there's one or two specific skill sets that you do better than the others. So we're looking at shooting, passing, rebounding, defending, and handling the ball, the five primary skill sets. I'm willing to bet there's one of those that you do better than the others. And when you guys look in the NBA, outside of the top 20 players, everyone else in the NBA, to some degree, is a role player. They have one or two specific skill sets that they perform at an elite level. And that's one thing that I want you guys to think of, is think of what's the skill set that you bring to the table that is elite. And then it clearly it needs to be within the role that you have on this team. It needs to fit into the overall puzzle of what this team needs for you to do, but that's also what you'll hang your hat on when you leave here, is that specific skill set. If I say a name like J.J. Redick or Kyle Korver, what skill sets do those two guys have? Yeah, and it's catch and shoot. It ain't even dribble and shoot. It is such a narrow, specific skill set. It is catch and shoot, catch and shoot, catch and shoot. I've watched those guys work out. Do you know what they do during 99% of their workout? They catch and shoot, catch and shoot. You think Kyle Korver's in a gym right now doing defensive slides or doing two ball drills for hours on end? He's not. He knows the one thing that he brings to the table that gives his team the best chance of being successful so he can, he can fill in his role to the best of his ability, and that's what he focuses on. And I'm not saying this because I don't want you to be well-rounded players, and I'm certainly not saying just because you can shoot the ball that you don't play defense or don't do the other things. I'm telling you that you need to have the awareness to know what you do really, really well. And it needs to match the awareness that the coaching staff has of you. Because if you think you're a great three-point shooter and Coach Hurley disagrees, guess which opinion matters most? His. While you're here, his matters most. So it's important that you open up the lines of communication and you talk with your staff about exactly what it is that you need to do for this team to be as successful as possible. Because when you've signed up to be part of something bigger than yourself, your role is not what you want it to be. Your role is going to be what everyone in this room needs it to be for the team to be successful. Now, in a perfect world, those two things will align. What you want it to be, what you're really good at, and what the team needs are all going to be the same thing. And if we can go down the line and say that about every one of you, and every one of you holds each other accountable, and every one of you puts in the extra work every single day, that's the recipe for being a champion. I mean, that's it. Don't make it any harder than it needs to be. I've just told you guys exactly what it'll take to win a national championship. Each of you knowing your role, embracing your role, starring in your role, 
holding each other accountable, doing the extra work, being a leader, and never, met, you know, never missing the basics, staying in love with the basics. You, go, you guys do those things, and you're right there. You're with any program in the country, guaranteed. And who controls whether or not you guys do those things? Just you. Nobody else. See, I'm hoping that gives you guys some, some confidence. I'm hoping that's an empowering feeling. Like, wait, the one thing I want the most in this world while I'm in college is to win a national championship? And I can do that if I do those basic things and I can get the 14 guys next to me to do those basic things, I greatly increase the chance of that happening? Yeah. Like, that should excite you. That should make you wake up every single day saying, I'm going to be the best I can be, and I'm going to make that so contagious that everyone else in this room does the same. And if you guys can do that, it's right there. It's right there. And it takes a lot of humility to be able to accept the role that might not be the role that you want it to be. And I know that's one of the hardest parts about playing at this level. Because when you guys were in high school, you may have had a more prominent role than you have now. And you probably want that role now. And that's a good thing. I hope that drives you. But you need to make sure that you embrace and star in the role that you have while you work relentlessly to earn the role that you want. So if you believe you're a great three-point shooter, Coach Hurley happens to disagree, which means right now your role in this team is not to shoot threes. I don't think he's going to lock the door so you can't come in and work on your threes before and after every practice and every workout until you can prove to him that you're able to do that, that you're able to add that skill to the team. But you have to star in the role you have while you earn the role that you want. And if you're willing to make that sacrifice every single day, I'm telling you guys, you control the keys to the car. It's my opinion, in the college basketball landscape, there's what, 340 teams? There's about 20, and I know there's more parity today, and that, that, that mid-majors and so forth, they're, they're creeping a little bit. But for the most part, there's about 20 programs that have the potential to actualize what they're capable of and cut down the nets. And you guys are one of those programs. You have the talent, you have the resources, you have the coaching staff to be the best of the best. And now it's completely up to you guys. And, and in order to do that, you have to hold yourselves accountable and you have to take full responsibility for every decision you make. You can't blame, you can't complain, you can't defer, you can't deflect, you can't make any excuses. You guys have the keys to the car and whether or not you do anything with it is completely up to you. And I, I really, I mean, I, I want you all to make that decision. And here's how we can break that down from a decision-making process. You guys all to a man just raised your hand and said, you want to play professional basketball. Outstanding. I want you to use that as the filter to every single decision you make moving forward. Every decision you make, I want you to run it through that filter. Is doing this right now, whatever it may be, is this going to take me closer to being a pro or is it going to take me further away from being a pro? Every decision, because the little stuff matters. See, little things make a huge difference. This meal I'm about to eat right now, does this take me closer to being a pro? Does it show that I want to take care of my body and I want to fuel myself for high performance? Does it take me closer to being a pro or does it take me further away? Does sleeping in a missing class take me closer to being a pro or further away? Does giving 80% during the strength training workout, does that take me closer to being a pro or does it take me further away? See, if you can break it down so everything's binary and everything's completely black and white, it makes life so much simpler. Because then all you have to do is every decision you're going to make, that's all you have to ask. Like, I don't really feel like going in and getting shots up today. Is skipping that going to take you closer to being a pro? No, it's not. It's going to take you further away. And clearly, you guys are smart enough to know that unless you consistently make a choice that takes you closer to being a pro, you're going to decrease the chances of that actually happening. And we can substitute being a pro with winning a national championship. It's the same thing. I'm hoping those two things are in perfect alignment. I'm hoping you're so driven individually that you want to be a pro, that you're willing to use that within the confines of your role to help this team win a national championship. See, when those two things are in alignment, there's nothing wrong with having individual goals. I'm glad that every single one of you wants to be a pro. Because if you use that correctly, that will greatly increase the chance of you guys winning together. And every single decision goes through that filter. And you have to make those consistently. And then when you don't, there shouldn't be any confusion. 
If you end up not being a pro, I'm willing to bet you look where you dropped all the breadcrumbs, you'll see plenty of chances that you had to make a better decision and you chose not to. And that's where the accountability comes in. Because I know you want to be a pro. So if I see you keep making decisions that aren't in alignment with being a pro, I'm going to tell you because I'm your teammate, because I care. So if you guys can, can do that, now you've created something special. And then it's a matter of doing it consistently. And that's where these little things will always add up. And you have to be willing to embrace, as I said, that your role might not be exactly what you want it to be. But know that about the other guys in this room. Because regardless of what your role is, everyone in this room needs to have a respect and appreciation and value what everybody else's role is. Not even just players, whether it's managers, whether it's video folks, whether it's coaching staff, every single one of you needs to have an appreciation and respect and value what everyone else's role is. Once you have that type of role clarity, now we've created a foundation which we can move on. And that next step I've already talked about a little bit is the accountability factor. See, once you guys have already created standards of excellence, and the standards of excellence, that thumbprint has already been at UConn for a long time. So I told you, you guys are part of a program that's much bigger than any one single person in this room. This is a historic program. And that thumbprint is already on there. So now you have to be willing to hold each other accountable to the standards that you've created. I guarantee we could come up with a killer list right now of standards that are required for you guys to win a national championship. And you could come up with a great list. How well you police each other and hold each other accountable to those standards is all that matters. Identifying them and writing them on a board isn't going to do anything for you. Living up to that code and holding each other accountable at all times, that's what culture is. You guys have heard the word culture because it's everywhere. And, and culture is what will determine the, the long-term sustainable results for you as an individual and you guys collectively. And ultimately, culture are the values and the behaviors and the experiences that you guys have every single day as part of UConn basketball. And you have to live those out. And in order to have an incredibly high culture, there can't ever be any slippage. See, great cultures, th this, doesn't, this isn't their week right here. Great cultures are consistent, and that's how you all need to be. Which means if a team captain's not here, there's no slippage during practice. If Coach Hurley's not here, there's no slippage during practice. That you guys are willing to do everything you can to actualize your potential every single day. That's the type of culture you need. And that culture, as we said, is holding people accountable through love and through grace and through caring enough about them. You should want a teammate that gets on you when you don't do what you're supposed to do. In the moment, it sucks. No one likes to be called out. No one likes to be, you know, I get it. But if you can take a step back, be a spectator to your own emotions, watch it as if it's a movie and you just happen to watch a character that's playing you and ask yourself, is what this person's telling me, is this gonna help me be the best version of myself? More than likely, the answer is yes. And when the answer is yes, you should be thankful for that. You should be thankful to have people in your life that hold you guys accountable. Now I want to switch gears for just a second and just kind of talk about communication. Because communication is vital. And I know you probably have been told how important it is to communicate on the court and to talk loud and talk consistently and with a presence and all of that's true. But I want you guys to know from a communication standpoint that you're always communicating something. Even when you're not speaking, even when you don't think you're communicating, you are communicating something. And every communication is either going to strengthen a connection you have with a teammate or a coach, or it's going to erode it. And you have to make sure that you're making the decision to consistently strengthen every relationship. Because when I go back to those pillars, and I told you the first pillar is the pillar you have with yourself, well, the second one is the pillar you have with each other. And how much are you doing to support, assist, push, this, the guy next to you. Like, do you, do you care enough about this team that you're willing to push in practice the guy that gets a few more minutes than you? The guy that starts in front of you? Are you selfless enough to recognize that, hey, that's coach's decision and I'm going to, to man up and be the best that I can be to push him so that he can play even better in games? When you can get to that level, I'm telling you, you've created something special. And then, of course, that last pillar is the relationship you guys have with your coaches and make sure that you're the type of player that you would want to coach if you were a coach. Don't do anything that makes their job harder. 
more times than not, that's the stuff you guys do off the court. Don't do anything that makes their job harder. They're here to help you guys. They're here to help you all win a national championship and go down in history, and they're here to help empower you so that you guys can make your livelihoods playing the game of basketball for a living. They're here in service of you. So why would you ever do anything that makes their job harder? Don't. If you know that skipping class is going to give one of these guys a headache, then don't do it. Because by definition, that's being selfish. Anytime you do something that steps out of bounds or undermines the standards you've created to be a national championship level team, it's an act of selfishness. Same thing with not being the best version of yourself. If you choose to come to practice and you chose not to get a good night's sleep, you chose not to hydrate, you chose not to eat well, you chose not to go in and get your therapy, you made all of those decisions, you're basically choosing yourself over the team. You are choosing to be selfish when you come to practice and you're not prepared. Because the only way you guys can, can actualize your potential is if every one of you comes every single day as the best version of yourself. So don't, don't let selfishness win out. And selfishness is a natural tendency. That's what makes all of this so hard. See, we go back to that basic and easy dichotomy. I know for a fact that everything that I'm telling you guys, I'm saying with a very matter-of-fact tone. This stuff is very basic. I don't think I've lost any one of you for a split second. I have nine-year-old twin sons and a seven-year-old daughter. They understand everything that I'm saying right now. This stuff is basic, but you guys know firsthand not a single thing I've said is easy. Not any of it. So don't think that I think what I'm asking you to do is easy. If you think that it's easy to show up every single day and be the best version of yourself, you think it's easy to hold the guys next to you accountable to be the best that they're capable of being, it's not. You know how hard that is. But that's why the reward will be something that very few people ever get to experience. Because very few people are willing to make the sacrifice to do the things that I'm encouraging you all to do. And the fact that you are the ones that control your own destiny in that regard. You don't control whether or not you win or you lose. You don't control that. Because clearly if you did, you would never lose a game. Because I don't think anybody in here wants to lose. So this is not about guarantees, because I can't promise you anything. I can't promise you that you'll be All-American. I can't promise you you'll play professionally. I can't promise you you'll win uh, a national championship. What I can promise you is doing these things every day greatly increases the chance that those things happen. And that's all any of us should be in the business of doing, is trying to get the statistics lined up in our favor. I don't want whether or not you play pro to be a coin flip. I don't want it to be a coin flip. I want it to be so heavily skewed in your favor that we'll all be shocked if it doesn't happen. They talk all the time in hoops about a 50-50 ball, right? A loose ball is a 50-50 ball, right? You've heard that? See, I don't, I don't believe in a 50-50 ball. Why would it be a 50-50 ball? Why is it not a 90-10 ball in UConn's favor every single time? Why is it 50-50? Who said that? Just because it's there? No, if you guys condition yourself to play as hard and work as hard and do everything to the best of your ability, you're relentless in your pursuit of greatness, then there's no reason a loose ball is a 50-50 ball. Because if it's loose and I want it a thousand times more than you do, it ain't 50-50. I'm getting that ball. End of discussion. And I want the same thing for you guys. I want the odds of you winning a national championship and I want the odds of you playing professionally to be so stacked heavily in your favor. And if for any reason any of those things do not come to fruition, it's not because of something you had control over. There will be times simply you just play another team and they're better than you. That, that happens. That's life. There might be one roster spot left on a team and the guy that gets it is a little bit better than you. That's okay. That's not something you have control over. But how, how crappy would that be to exit from the tournament early and you look back and you guys all know that the reason that happened is because you didn't do everything in your power? See, there's only two things in this world that each of you has 100% control over 100% of the time. There's only two. Your effort and your attitude. Those are the only two things you control all of the time. And I want to encourage you guys to put all of your emphasis into those two things your effort and your attitude. Don't worry about anything else. Block out everything else. Your effort and your attitude. And get those as close to that 100 point ceiling as you can in everything you do. Now I was told you guys have uh, Justin, there's a mental, a mental skills coach that works with you guys, right? Phenomenal. You guys should be incredibly thankful for that. I, I don't know that you realize the edge that that can give you. And 
what I'm going to share with you now, um, I've done a lot of study in that area, and I'm certainly hoping is on par and parallel with the stuff that he talks about with you, because I would never want to say something that undermines something else. And I had talked about some of this stuff even at, at DeMatha. But when we look at what mental toughness is, and when we look at your ability to be the best player you can be, it all really comes down to your ability to be in the present moment, which is the call to play present. If you guys can learn how to play present, then you'll be able to actualize your physical potential. You'll be able to actualize and maximize your athleticism and actualize and maximize your skill. And being in the present moment means three things. It means you only focus on the next play. It means you only focus on the controllables. You control the controllables. And it means you only focus on the process. If you can do those three things for the vast majority of the time you're on the court, then you will be the best player that you're capable of. So let's look at the next play mindset. Next play mindset means no matter what just happened in this current play, that play is over, it's done, and I move to the next play. You miss a wide open dunk, it's over, next play, sprint back on defense. You turn the ball over with a lazy pass. Coach Hurley's gonna yell at you guaranteed, it's over, next play. The referee misses a call. Has a referee ever missed a call in a game you guys have played? Yeah, it happens occasionally, right? Yeah. Keep in mind, you guys aren't perfect. You're not perfect players, right? So why do we have this assumption that referees are going to be perfect? Why do we feel like they have to get every single thing right, and at the end of the game, you guys as a team will have missed a bunch of shots, turned the ball over a handful of times, there will have been a few 50-50 balls that you didn't get, and yet we always want to scapegoats and say it's the guys with the footlocker shirts, it's their problem, they were the ones that didn't do their job. Put that out of your mind. Referees are an absolute non-issue. They have nothing to do with the outcome of a game. And believing that they do, complaining that they do, scapegoating that they do is a mindset of the week. Now, if Coach Hurley wants to talk to the referees, that is part of his job description as a head coach, he can do that. You guys don't ever have to worry about the referees. Referee clearly misses a call when you're driving to the basket. So what? Next play. That's what being mentally tough is. The definition of mental toughness is be able to block out all distractions, and focus on the next important thing. That's what mental toughness is. It has nothing to do with running until you puke or doing a wall sit till your legs you know, are shaking or, or somebody in your face MFing you. That has nothing to do with mental toughness. Mental toughness means that no matter what is going on in the world, you have the ability to hone in and focus on the next important thing. And in the game of basketball, the next important thing is always the next play. You miss a shot, it's over you move on to the next play. When you look at the, I mean, in my opinion, Steph Curry will end up going down as the greatest shooter that the game's ever seen. I, I, I believe that. And one of the things that makes him so remarkable is his next play mentality. That he can miss eight shots in a row, and he shoots the ninth one as if he made the previous eight shots. Every single time he shoots the ball, he believes with every fiber of his being that that ball is going in. There is never a doubt in his mind. He could miss 20 shots in a row, game's tied with two seconds left, and he's begging for the ball because he knows the next shot is always good. That's the next play mentality. I don't remember the exact stats on it, but I think it was two years ago, if you guys remember, he had a streak of consecutive games where he made a three in the NBA. It was up in the 250s. I want to say it was like 257, 258, consecutive games where he made a three, NBA record, and then he had a really bad shooting night. I think he went 0 for 11. And, he, and that was the first time he didn't make a three in 250 games. Do you guys know what he did the very next game, less than 48 hours later? Do you remember what he did? He broke the NBA record for most threes made in a game. He went from, in him, for him having the worst shooting night of his life to having an NBA record-breaking night in less than 48 hours. Do you think he ate anything differently to make that happen? Do you think he tweaked his form, did some new drills? He didn't do anything except have the next play mentality. Except say, last night didn't go as well as I'd hoped. That one's over. It's time to move on. And I focus on the next game. So you have to focus on the next play. Even if your coaches don't focus on the next play. You make a bonehead mistake and Coach Hurley is still yelling at you for it three plays later. You don't have to worry about him. He chooses what he's going to focus on and yell at. You can choose to focus, focus on the next play. So if you have the next play mentality, that and that alone will put you in the upper 1% of all players. Same thing when something good happens. You know, I know we see it all the time in the NBA. So you make a three. 
Congratulations, that's your job. You don't need to dance around and celebrate it. You made a three. Get back on defense. Because you guys know that with, with the game played at the pace that it's played at, you miss a layup and you choose to pout about it, you choose to be in your feelings, you choose to have bad body language, and you choose to jog back on defense, your guy just scored two points on the other end. So not only did you just cost the team two points by missing a wide open layup, you've now cost us four points, maybe five, because you chose not to move to the next play. Same thing, you make a three and you're so excited to dance around about it and your guy goes down and makes a layup. So the good that you just deposited in our team's bank account, we've now had to pay out because you chose to celebrate too early. Move to the next play. And that next play mentality, we should be able to read it on your face and your body language. If, if, if I were to watch film, if I were to have Trip send me some film, and I were to mute it, and I were to take off all of the graphics, and I were to just watch your face and your body language, I shouldn't know whether you made or missed your last shot. I shouldn't know whether you're up 10 or you're down 10. I think one of the best to ever do that is Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan's face, whether he's winning or losing, making or missing, it never changes because he's level and he's consistent. See, I don't want you guys playing like this. And I'm not saying that it's not okay to be excited when you're playing well. You make a big play, you get an and one, like it's okay to be excited. But I need to make sure that you guys are level and you're consistent. Because the goal is to not have the dips. To be champions, we have to be ramping up. That trajectory is most important. So the first pillar is next play. Second pillar is what I just told you, which is to control the controllables. Your attitude and your effort. So here's something you all need to understand. Will you, will you guys acknowledge that working hard is a choice? When you work hard, is it because you chose to work hard? Yeah, working hard is a choice. Do you guys realize, though, that if working hard is a choice, by default, that means not working hard is also a choice. So you can't have it both ways. And as logical as that sounds, and I don't mind if you roll your eyes at that because it sounds so obvious, but here's what happens with most, most players. When you work hard, you made the choice to work hard. When I call you out for not working hard, you're going to make excuses. I was tired. I wasn't feeling well. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. And we make excuses. Uh-uh. If you're going to take the credit and the praise when you work hard, then you have to be man enough to accept when you choose not to. And of course, we're consistently trying not to make that choice. But effort falls on you and only you. There's only one person in the world that decides whether or not you sprint the floor both ways as fast as you can. There's only one person in the world that chooses whether or not you die for a loose ball. There's only one person that chooses whether or not you box out every single time a shot is taken. And that's you. You're the only one that chooses that. And the effort at which you execute that is always your choice. So you really can't hide behind anything else. That is your choice. And you have to own it. And there will be times where you choose not to give your best effort. And I want you to be able to acknowledge that to apologize that with a my bad, and then just make sure it doesn't happen again. The worst thing about the my bads is when you keep saying them. Like if your guy keeps beating you to the basket and you keep saying my bad, it's like, okay, we know it's your bad. Stop doing it. Don't let him get to the basket. Like one time is okay. One time it's a mistake. Second time it's now become a decision. And you have to own that. And then now let's look at attitude. Let's look at attitude more from a level of feedback. Because I think the secret to you guys, each being the best you can be, and the team being the best that you're capable of, is in your ability to accept and process feedback. Because feedback's gonna be coming at you all of the time. As players, it's coming at you every day from your coaches, but now in this world that we live in of social media and everything with full transparency, I mean, there's feedback all of the time. Within seconds after playing a game, there's plenty of feedback on whether or not you played well or not. So there's a couple things that you guys have to be able to do with feedback. One, you have to be able to discern whether or not the feedback is legit or not. Because you don't have to listen to nor accept everyone's feedback. It's important that you insulate yourself from those that you don't need it. There's only a handful of people that you should be taking feedback from. They all happen to be in this room right now. All the people on, online and on IG and on Twitter and all that, you don't have to listen to any of that. You don't need any of that feedback. If some random person walks off the street and tells you you need to change your shooting form, you don't need to listen to that. If someone on this coaching staff says something, that's what you have to be able to listen to. So you have to discern which feedback's appropriate. 
But then the most important part, and this is something else I'm hoping you guys find very empowering, no matter what the feedback is, whether you think it's good or bad, whether it's praise or constructive, it doesn't matter what it is, you control how to use that feedback. And if you want to be a high performer and you want to be a champion, you will always choose to use the feedback in a way that moves you forward and gets you better. So you guys played yesterday. We're watching film right now. Coach Hurley makes a couple comments about a play that you made. No matter what his comments are, you and only you choose how to use that feedback. You don't control what he says or what he thinks, but you decide how to use that. If he praises you and says, you did a great job, look at that extra pass you made, that was awesome, you choose whether or not to say, you know what, that I'm going to store that one in my muscle memory and remember that that's the type of play that I need to make to be a part of UConn basketball. And the oldest adage to success is to do more of what works and do less of what doesn't. So I'm going to do more of that. That's the right type of play. I have to remember that. In that type of situation, that was the right play. If he gets on you because you, let's say a guy beat you on defense, you weren't squared up or whatever, you choose whether to get pissed off, roll your eyes and say he doesn't know what he's talking about or to say, you know what, he does. He wants what's best for me. He wants what's best for this team. I'm going to listen to what he's saying and I'm going to execute it better next time so that I can be a better player. No matter what the feedback is, you choose how to use it. And because there's no shortage of feedback, if every single time you get feedback, you use it in a way that makes you better, and every single day you've already w you, you wake up with the mindset that you're going to put in work with intention and purpose to get better, that means every day you're moving up. Every single day. And that's ultimately what's most important. Where you are right now at this moment is not near as important as the direction that you're headed. The trajectory at which you're going is far more important than where you are at this moment. And you have to remember that. And the only person that controls that ramp going up or that ramp going down is you. And then the last piece is you have to, to trust the process and respect the process. And I know especially with the Sixers, that's such a, a, a word, a buzzword now, but the process is going to control the outcome. Think about a brick wall. You can't think about building the brick wall in its entirety. All you have control over is laying each brick perfectly. If you lay each brick with care and precision, there's a very good chance that that wall will take care of itself. But that's the only way. If you step back and you just worry about the big picture and you just start throwing bricks and you're sloppy with bricks, there's no way that it's going to end up as a sound, sturdy wall. So each of you have already said that you want to be a national champion and each of you wants to be a professional basketball player. So in order to do that, every single day of your life, you have to make sure you're laying perfect bricks. And everything's a brick. The meal you choose is a brick. The time you choose to go to bed is a brick. Whether or not you do your work is a brick. Whether you come in to make 500 game shots from game spots at game speed is another brick. Whether or not you listen with, with good body language during a, a film breakdown is a brick. Every single drill you run in practice is a brick. Every one of them is a brick. And ask yourself, are you laying perfect bricks? Or are you just going through the motions? See, you don't realize it at your age, because I didn't when I was your age either. But those things matter. Those little things done consistently, that's all you've got. And because you guys have the talent and the resources, there is nothing that can get in your way from accomplishing both of those things. Being pros and being national championships. There's nothing that will get in your way except for yourself. And I don't want you guys to let that happen. And I don't want you to let it happen to each other. So make sure we're consistent with everything we do. I know that is a lot for me to throw at you. I do want to make sure I've got some time. If you guys have some questions or there's some other things that you guys want to talk about. But I can't stress enough. If you're sitting there right now and you're going, I know everything you just said, dude. I got it. I got it. I realize that. I don't think I told you anything that you don't know. But only you can look in the mirror and say, are you actually doing it? Knowing and doing. Close that gap. If we can do that, I'm telling you, man, you guys, you've got a really special group and you've got a very special opportunity. Do you guys have any questions or some thoughts or anything I can share with you? And certainly, I know I've been talking right at the, the players, but coaches, if there's anything else I can share with you guys, what you thinking, Eric? Coach, can you just talk about, you've been around some of the highest level players. Mm -hmm. Talk about distractions, because that might go to your point of making a decision. Do I, is this going to make me be a pro or not? But, I mean, there's obviously a lot of distractions for guys. Yes. 
first and foremost, you need to insulate yourself with a very small group of people. And you have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, these people love you, they care about you, they want to see you happy, they want to see you successful, they want to see you succeed because it's good for you, not because of what it can do for them. And because you guys are such accomplished players and you have such bright futures, as you already know, there will be lots of people that try to latch on because they know they can reap a benefit because you're doing all of the things that I just told you to do. And that becomes increasingly hard if those people are family, if those people are longtime friends. So you just have to make sure that you are insulating yourself with people that want to see you be successful. See, there's, there's a saying that if, if you do well, then you can do good. Which means anyone that's going to get in your way of you being the best version of yourself, anyone that's going to impede your chance of winning a national championship and becoming a pro, you've, you've got to find a way to, to get away from that. Because if you can do that, and when you do that, then you can help as many people as you want. You can help your family, you can help your friends, you can help anyone that you want. But you can't let them, if they impede your chance of doing those things, then you're never going to reap the fruits that they want you to reap in the first place. And none of them will ever do it intentionally. This is all in the subconscious. But the, the most important thing you can do is insulate yourself and get rid of as much friction as possible. If I had you guys go out to the track right now and start running laps, it'd be a lot harder if you had a 100-pound weight vest on, wouldn't it? I mean, a lot harder. Well, if you're trying to drag people through life and they're nothing but an anchor to you, all they do is take from you and energy from you and they get in your way and they, they allow you to make excuses. They tell you it's okay that you didn't come to the optional workout because I'm your boy, man. It's cool. No problem. No, that's not cool. Anyone that allows you and enables you to not do those things, that is not cool. You don't want those people in your life. And it makes it really, really hard, like I said, if that person's been in your life for most of your life. I'm not saying that that would be easy incredibly hard decision to make. But if you've decided that in your future, every decision that you make is going to help you win a national championship and help you become a pro, then if anything that this person wants you to do is contrary to that, they simply can't be a part of the circle. So you have to insulate yourself. And then you need to make sure that you're modeling your behavior after the type of people that you want to emulate. So, and this isn't about who's your favorite player per se. But who are the guys that you know, either at the current college level or at the pro level, that put in work, that do exactly what they need to do, and then make sure you're emulating those guys? You know, one of my mentors said, success leaves clues, so follow them. Like, find out what these guys are doing, and then do those things. And it's not about playing the comparison game, because that's a slippery slope. That can be a dangerous track. But I think effort's one that there's never a problem complaining about or, or comparing with. Like right now, in your heart of hearts, do you really and truly believe that you are the hardest worker in this room? Do you really believe that? Now some of you, if you're being honest, you shouldn't believe that because you're not. But I would want every single one of you to actually believe you're the hardest worker because of the efforts you put in. And here's, here's an exercise I've done with teams. I'm not going to do it with you guys. It would be out of my place, but certainly if the coaching staff wanted to do it. If I had a series of index cards right now, and I handed them out, and I said, all right, I want each of you, this is completely anonymous, no one will ever know what you wrote down. I want you to write down who the most talented player in the room is, and I want you to pass those in. And I'm gonna give you another card. I want you to write down who is the hardest worker in this room. You pass those in. And I'm gonna keep asking you questions. I wanna I want know who's the toughest person in this room. You guys all write it down. You're voting, we're not voting. Who's the most selfish person in this room? Who's the most apathetic or laziest person in this room? And I want to collect that data. I want to see what you guys think. And I would love to see what some of those answers are. Because for some of you, I know it could end up being very eye-opening. I can tell you right now that in order for you to have a chance to be the best that you're capable of, whoever you all think is the most talented player on the team, that person better also be the hardest worker. That person better also be the toughest. That person also better be the best teammate. And I want each and every one of you to believe that's you. And I want you to work to make that you. I want each of you to feel the ownership of this team that you're willing to step up and lead. The worst mistake you can make, which, which guys are my freshmen? You're a freshman, you were a freshman, right? We've got three freshmen in here? Yeah. The worst mistake you guys can make as freshmen is to think it's not my place to lead because I'm a freshman. I'm gonna wait 
and when I'm a junior or senior, then I'll lead. If no one else is going to step up and lead, you guys lead now. You take it upon yourself. And you guys that are older and have been here, you should feel more ownership because you have been here. And your leadership should not only welcome the freshmen and to, to, to show them the ropes, but you should take it upon yourself to be the leader. And every person in this group has, has the opportunity to lead. There's no rule that says there's one leader. Even Coach Hurley. Coach Hurley is a leader of this program. He shouldn't be the only leader. If he is the only leader in this entire room, you guys, you've got a, a major uphill battle. Every single one of you should feel a sense of ownership and should feel a sense of leadership. This is your program as much as it is anyone else's. So look to the guys that do things at the highest level. Don't try to be them, but emulate the habits and the behaviors that they have and then make that contagious. That's always, that's always the next step. How good of a player you are is only one step. How good you make everyone else is what will define you as a player and ultimately that's what your legacy will be. And that, that got me thinking one more thing. Because you guys all wanna be pros, which is great, you increase your chance of being a pro if this team does well. You guys win at a high level and every single one of you, your stock goes up because without question, the number one thing that the NBA looks for are winners, people that can win. Of course they want athleticism. Of course they want skill. That's a given. That's an ante just to sit at the table. They want guys that they know can win. And every single one of you, every time you win a game, collectively everyone's stock goes up a little bit. You start winning at a high clip. You win conference championship, you win a national championship. Your individual chance of playing professional has just gone up tenfold. Way more than if you average dub a double-double. Like, that's cool. Everybody in the NBA average a double-double. That doesn't matter. So that's why what you want for yourself has to align with what the team needs. This is a team sport. Nothing should be more important than UConn basketball. Nothing should be more important than winning a national championship. But if you do it right, doing those things at a high level will also get you the things that you guys desire on an individual level. Then everybody wins. What other questions we got? What else did you pick up from Kobe? <sighs> Kobe was an interesting one. I mean, we're not BFS by any means. I got to watch a couple of his workouts. But there was a couple things I picked up. One. His definition of sacrifice I find really interesting because I heard in a separate interview, I didn't have this conversation with him, someone said something to the effect of, you know, um, are you cool with all of the sacrifices you made to be a great player? And he was like, sacrifices? What are you talking about? I never made a single sacrifice. I did what I wanted to do. I decided my number one goal was to be the best player that I could be and everything I did was in alignment to that. So going to the gym at four in the morning for him was not a sacrifice. That was what he wanted to do because this was the thing that he wanted so bad. It wasn't punishment. That's something else you guys have to realize. And this is something I tell my own three children all the time. Repetition is not punishment. Repetition is the mother of all skill. Repetition is the oldest and most effective form of learning that will never, ever change. If you want to be a good shooter, there's only one recipe for it. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Now they have to be game specific reps. They have to be reps with perfect footwork and perfect shooting form. This is not about casually going in and shooting for a couple hours. This is going in with intention and purpose. And that's the thing I, I got from Kobe. You know, if, you, if we look at the, the spectrum of players that go in and shoot, on the, on the high school level, you've got the kids that go in and, you know, they got, maybe they even have one of the, the shootaways and they, they made 500 shots. They barely broke a sweat. They're cool with that. And on the other end, you have Kobe who every single shot, he's not doing anything from a catch and shoot. Everything he's doing, he's making a specific L cut or a V cut. He's trying to get open before he even earns the right to shoot. This is, he's not in it to play horse. He's in it. The reason he wants to be able to make these shots is because he knows he's going to have an all NBA defensive player on him. And if he doesn't even get open to get the ball, there's no shot to take. So everything he's doing, he is running through at game speed. That's another thing. When we look at the court, I would imagine there are specific shots in your offense and with your position and your style of play that you get more shots in certain areas of the court. So the first part of awareness is, do you even know where that is? And, and I'm not saying that to call you out. If you don't, it's something you need to speak with the coaching staff about or watch on Synergy and get, get some footage. 
Do you know where most of the shots you take are? And I'm not asking you specifically. I hope the answer to that's yes. If it's no, then you need to find that out. Because if, if over the course of the season, you are never ever going to shoot the ball from the left corner, then I don't need you practicing any shots from the left corner. It's a waste of your time, it's a waste of your energy. I need you to double down on the areas that the team needs you to be strong on. So that's the other thing that Kobe would do. He would look at the specific areas that he knows he gets the vast majority of his shots. And let's be honest, he's a volume shooter, so he gets a lot of shots. And he would make sure that he works on those different areas. And then he sets everything up at game speed. So there's, there's none of this casualness about it. Everything is a hard cut right into perfect form. And that's where purpose and intention will outweigh volume. See, if we're going to really, and, and this, this probably is something maybe even uh, Justin has talked to you guys about. You've got someone that says, I, I come in and I'm going I'm to take 500 shots a day. Well, take 500 shots a day doesn't do anything. I can take 500 shots. If the ball doesn't go in the basket, who cares? That's the name of the game. So then you have someone that comes in and says, well, I make 500 shots a day. Okay, now we're getting closer. But if you want the Kobe mentality, Kobe comes in and he makes one shot 500 separate times. And that might sound like verbal semantics, but it's not. The only shot in the world that matters to him is the next one. He's not worried about logging 500. He's worried about cutting to get open and make that one shot because that one shot is the game winner of a game seven. That's all that matters. And then the moment that shot, regardless of whether it goes in or doesn't, that one's over and he moves to the next play. I've got one shot. This entire workout, all I have is this one shot and I'm gonna do this to the best of my ability. That's all that matters. When you can have that type of mindset and that is a, a Kobe type mindset, then you've got something really, really special. Yes? Uh, outside working hard, what's something that you see common in like high level players? In addition to working hard, okay, so there's actually, there's a triangle that we need, and you just hit the first one, which is working hard, which is a given. The next is you have to work smart. Have to work smart. So a perfect example would be what I just told you. If you know that you're never going to shoot from the bottom left corner, then you spending 20 minutes working on that is a waste of your time, it's a waste of your energy. That would not be working smart. But then the third is, you have to work hard, you have to work smart, but you have to do those things consistently. Anyone can work hard on a day they feel good. Anyone can work smart when they've got a coach standing over them. But can you do those two things consistently? And working hard, this is something all of you have heard since you were little kids. You gotta work hard, you gotta work hard. Anytime someone wins an award, yeah, I just got the MVP. Uh, yeah, it's because I worked hard, we know. Well, what is working hard? Working hard is intentionally leaving your comfort zone with purpose. It is pushing yourself mentally, physically, and emotionally past what you feel like you're capable of doing in the moment. That's what working hard is. And if you can do that with the intention and purpose of working smart, and you can do that consistently, now you're on on part of being the best that you can be. So the working, because you have to have all three. If you work hard and you work smart, but you only do it every other Tuesday, you're not gonna be a very good player. If you work really, really hard every single day, but you're just spinning your wheels because you're not working smart, you're doing dumb stuff, you're never gonna be a good player. And clearly, it doesn't matter how smart you are and how consistently you do it. If you don't put in the effort, you'll never be the player that you're capable of being. And that has to be the measuring stick that each of you use. Because it's not a matter of whether you're better than him or whether you guys are better than another. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with, are you the best that you're capable of? That's what should matter most. And you have to have that trifecta of work hard, work smart, and work consistently to even be considered the best that you're capable of. What else we got, guys? These are great questions. Let me just stand here awkwardly for a little bit longer. We can do that. What about my coaches? What do we got, guys? I would say with this team, the vertical is the most important that you talked about. The horizontal and vertical? And, vertical. and these guys holding each other accountable. Um, you know, it's hard to tell your peer, you know, hey, you got to do it this way or you got to be there on time. And that's where I think we're lacking in building that. And then the discipline to do it all the time. Like, we don't have, like, you're talking about being consistent, working hard, but having the discipline to do it over and over again is the hard thing. It definitely is. And you nailed it. And here's the thing, and you guys know this. 
The reason it's so hard to fall in love with the basics is because the basics are usually mundane and they're monotonous and they can get boring if you let them, which is why you have to find your fuel has to be in the outcome that you want. There ain't nothing boring or mundane about being a pro. There ain't nothing boring or mundane about winning a national championship. And in order to have those things, then you have to be willing to fall in love with the basics. And think about it too, it doesn't mean that you have to come in and do basic footwork for nine hours a day. It means you have to have razor sharp precision where you come in and you work on some basic stuff. You work on your form shooting, you work on your footwork. 10 minutes a day can make a huge difference. And then from there, you collectively start to build up. So you, you add more advanced moves, you do more advanced things. But I just don't want you guys making things more complicated than they are. Like here, I've been around the game of basketball my entire life. And here's how I've broken the game down. This is the most basic way I can tell you how to win a basketball game. And this is so obvious, you guys know this, and yet you make decisions constantly that are contrary to this. If you guys want to win as many games as possible and increase your chance of winning a national championship, here's exactly how you do it. On offense, you take the highest percentage shot possible every time. On defense, you make them take the lowest percentage shot possible every time. Right? Is that the game of basketball? If you do those two things, do you think you win most games? You absolutely win most games. So talking about running things through a binary filter, everything you do, and this is what makes basketball so hard because it's such a fast-paced game. You don't get the breaks that baseball and football get in between every play. So you guys have to have the IQ to, within a, a split second, say to yourself, is this pass I'm about to make, does this increase the chance we're going to get a high percentage shot or decrease it? You shooting this shot from this specific area, this time and score with this person on you, is that the best shot that we're capable of getting? If most times down the court we can answer yes to that, then you guys are doing everything you can to play at a high level. Same thing on defense. Clearly, you playing some Olay defense and letting him go get a wide open layup does not force them to take the highest percentage shot possible, so we can't have you do that. Which is why team defense and help side defense and communication and all the things you guys are taught are so important. But that's the, that's the filter you need to run it through. But think how many times that doesn't happen. Somebody wants to take a, a my turn shot. You know what a my turn shot is? Yeah, like I need to get some love. I want to put up a shot because I want to be a pro and everyone else keeps shooting, so it's my turn. I'm taking a shot. That, that violates the law, both laws, one, of you being a pro, and two, you guys winning a national championship. Because very, very, very rarely is a my turn shot the highest percentage shot that the team can get. And it takes unselfishness to do that. It takes a humility to know that me taking a, a semi-open 17-footer is not as good of a shot as me kicking it to you who's wide open on the wing. This will be a much higher percentage shot. And as much as I want to be on ESPN and as much as I want to knock this down right now, this is not what is best for our team. So I'm going to make the decision that is best for our team. Because ultimately what is best for our team will be best for myself. You can't ever forget that. I'm telling you, winning trumps everything. You all win and every person in this room stock goes up, including theirs. You guys see the coaching carousel, right? You win, everybody becomes more valuable. And while you may not control the outcome of winning, you absolutely can increase the chance of it happening by doing these things. Don't make things any more complicated than they need to be. And the, the, the leadership and the, the sustainability and the accountability, they're all things that you guys control. And you have to learn how to have those conversations with each other. Because it's human nature to get defensive. It's human nature, if you're, you're getting on me for something, for me to deflect, for me to make excuses. That's, I get it. One could go as far as to say that's normal behavior. But you can't have normal behavior when you're trying to attain something that's abnormal. Being a professional basketball player and winning a national championship is not normal. 99.999% .999 of human beings walking the earth will never experience either one of those things because they're not normal. Being the best college basketball team in the country is not normal. So you can't do normal things and expect something that abnormal. So you have to be willing to step out and do that. And this is where you guys need to be able to come together. Because if you call him out for not doing something and you get defensive, this is where we need some other people to try to make peace and to try to make this work. And it's not about pleasing other people. It's about doing what's right consistently. Doing what's right consistently, making sure everything lines up to the things that you guys want.
And if you're willing to do that, I'm telling you, the sky is the limit for you guys. You control it. There's nothing, I can't think of anything in the world more empowering than knowing how much control you have over your future based on the decisions that you make every single day. What other questions? Anything else? Where's my water? Yes, sir. I think we all hear the stories about like Kobe's obsession with the game and how he prepared. Um, have you seen any players train that kind of compare to that on that level, or is like Kobe just the most absurd thing you've ever seen? Well, a couple things with that, and and I mean, I do think Kobe has been wired differently than most human beings, without question. And there's a difference between trying to emulate behavior and trying to be like someone else. So I don't want any of you to think that you need to be like Kobe. See, I, that would actually happen a lot when I was still working at the high school level. Parents would say, you know, I heard Kobe works eight hours a day, so I'm going to make my kid work eight hours a day. I'm like, first of all, your kid ain't Kobe, so I think you can relax on that. But we don't have to try to copy what they're doing. We want to take things, run them through our filter of what we're capable of. But, I mean, at that Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, this was 2007, Steph Curry was actually one of the college counselors. Now, this was after his freshman year at Davidson. So if you guys go back and look, and I know you guys are really young, but the coaches will know, after his freshman year at Davidson, that was before he blew up on the college scene. That wasn't until his sophomore and junior year, so nobody even knew who Steph Curry was. For the most part, he got an invite to that camp because of his dad, Dell, who played in the NBA. In fact, most of the coaches didn't even know his name. At the camp, they just called him Dell's kid. Yeah, that's Dell's son over there. But I could tell immediately that there was something different about him. And the main thing was, at the end of the first workout, he and I had never met. We were just standing next to each other. And he says to me, Coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish five free throws in a row. That was his standard of excellence. That was his ticket to leave the gym was swishing five free throws in a row. Now, I don't know who the best free throw shooter is in this room, no matter how good you are. You, you have to admit, that's a high standard. That means you could swish four in a row, hit a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. It still goes in. You're still five for five. You're still mathematically perfect, but that wasn't good enough for him. He would start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 12 to 15 minutes to swish five in a row. And that's why I believe he'll go down in history as the greatest shooter the game's ever seen. And it's not by luck, it's not by accident, it's not because his dad played in the NBA, it's because he's willing to hold himself to that standard. And I share that with you because I'm not telling each of you that you shouldn't leave the gym until you swish five in a row. You come up with your own standard of excellence. You come up with your own way to police yourself to be the best that you can be. I had a talk with Steve Nash one time at one of his skills academies. And aside from the players that I have a personal relationship with, Steve Nash is my favorite player of all time. And he told me at the end of each of his off-season workouts, he would pick an unusual finish around the basket. So maybe it's a wrong foot layup, whatever. Maybe it's a floater. Um, he would pick uh, 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 an unusual finish, and he would make it 100 times. That would be the last thing he would do before he left the gym. That was his ticket out of there. And he said, inevitably, you're going to see me do something this season, and you're going to think I pulled it out of thin air. It's going to look like complete luck. It's not. I promise that whatever you see me do this season, I have done in a gym when no one else was watching. And we coined those the unseen hours. What will determine how well you progress as a player, whether or not you're a pro, and whether or not you all win a national championship falls heavily on what you guys do during the unseen hours. That's when the cameras aren't rolling and the cheerleaders aren't dancing. What you do then determines the type of player that you'll be. So yes, if you end every single workout by making 100 of this specific shot, then when you get in an actual game and you have the muscle memory and the basketball IQ, you're able to execute. I think that about all of the great players. I mean, clearly one of the best to ever do it, Ray Allen. You know, you, you talk about, people say these things are luck. You know, you watch Steph go off for 40, and the average basketball fan thinks a portion of that is luck. And that's almost insulting because they have no idea the amount of work that he put in during the unseen hours. I say this very respectfully. This is about the best compliment I could give somebody like that. If you knew how much work those guys put in during the unseen hours, scoring 40 in an NBA game becomes a lot less impressive. It's not that impressive when you know how much work has been put in in the offseason in off and behind the scenes. You know what would be shocking and miraculous? Someone that puts in no work and can do that. 
and that doesn't happen. So your all's ability to have a big game yourself or as a team, your guys' ability to do those types of things rests inherently on what you do during the unseen hours. And yet with that, the unseen hours is, is kind of a cool, sexy name to remind you of what it is when you're in the gym by yourself. But I also want you guys to realize someone is always watching you. I mean, always. So behave accordingly. Someone is always watching you. And especially since each of you have the goal of playing professionally, if you think the only time someone's watching you is when you're in games, or if there's a, a, a person here watching your practice, I'm telling you that's not the case. Someone is watching every single thing you are doing. This was a long, long time ago. I mean, it's been well over 10, 12 years, but a friend of mine is a scout for the Chicago Bulls. And he was coming in town. Uh, I live right near Georgetown. And Syracuse was coming in town to play Georgetown. And at this time, both teams had three or four potential first round picks. And the game was, I think the game was a two o'clock tip. It was an afternoon game. And he called me up and said, Alan, I'm gonna be in town. Would you like to come watch the game? I got you a ticket. I was like, sure, man. That was old Big East. Like, I'm in, let's do it. He said, meet me at the uh, arena at 11. I was like, 11? Game's at 2. It's not at 12. He's like, I know. I have to get in there early because I have to watch the players when they don't think anyone else is watching them. I want to see how they go through their pregame shoot-around. I want to see how focused they are when the strength coach is taking them through their warm-ups. I want to see how they treat the building service worker when they don't think anyone's watching. That's what I want to watch. And I kid you not, he took more notes during the time where he and I were the only people in the arena than he took when the game actually started. He wrote to, and I'm telling you now, I would never call a player out. There were guys on that list whose stock, at least in the eyes of the Chicago Bulls, there were guys whose stock went up based on how they prepared, and there were guys whose stock went down based on how they prepared. And in the NBA, especially with a first round pick, where you've got the slated salary already set, do you guys know what the increment is? Every time you drop one draft pick, do you know how much money you lose in your contract? It's around a quarter of a million dollars, close to three or 400,000 every time you drop. So think about that. You could drop five or six or seven places in the draft because someone has a question about how you prepare or a question about your character. You could cost you and your family millions of dollars because you choose not to do what's right at all times. And even worse, you could make some decisions that no one's gonna give you any money because they can't afford to have you in their organization because you're a liability. So behave as if someone is always watching you because at your level, someone is. What else we got, guys? These are such good questions. Awesome, man. One Thanks, Coach. Things, one of the things that I think that the biggest thing, I'm glad you touched on it a bunch, and you guys did, couldn't tell from where you were, is he, he spoke to you guys. Like, he's a positive speaker, so he didn't make eye contact with anyone in the last two rows from coaches and support staff. He was speaking like to you guys, you know, like that was his thing. I love that. Great. And, the, and like what Coach Hunter mentioned about that horizontal res accountability. Yeah. Like that's what we're striving for. Good. Yeah, like we are striving for that. Guys who've been there a while know like we're trying to get to that point. Like admittedly, right, we ain't there yet yep. now, but we have a lot closer than we were a year ago. That's awesome. We're trying to get there. The other thing I picked up on that I just wanted to say, your biggest, your real positive speaker about players and stuff and doing the right thing the biggest put down you had of a player is when you said something bad didn't didn't go right for you and you stayed in your feelings mm -hmm. stayed in your feelings that's like the biggest insult i felt that you gave a player staying in your feelings i think that's a great way of putting it we've heard that sometimes too as well so I, I'm, I'm like from my point of view i'm just glad you po touched on that cool and vertical accountability is coach hurley's up here and the coaching staff and then yes everyone and the horizontal accountability. Like, we all know at this age how hard it is for us to try, yes. for him to try to hope, call him out, for him to try to call him out, him to call him out, just to try to call so him out. So hard. And it's 10 times harder to receive it yes. from somebody. But that's what we're, we're like, we're trying to get there. Absolutely. Like we're trying to get there, we're getting better, we're trying not to stay in our feelings, Yes. and we're trying to hold each other accountable and stuff, but if we can, like you said a bunch of times, this group's got huge potential. So Absolutely. Thank you. Well, you know, I mean, with what he just said, there, there are a lot of things in life that are understandable, but they're not acceptable. And learning the difference between those two. 
I can only imagine that if I missed a wide open layup in front of a packed house, I would be in my feelings. I think as a human being, we can all agree that's an understandable feeling. Doesn't mean it's acceptable. I understand why you're pouting, but I can't allow you to not sprint back on defense. And what Coach just mentioned, what you guys are so fortunate to have is you have the awareness and the humility to acknowledge what he just said so perfectly. You're not there yet. And you know what? When you do get there, I still want you to have the mindset that you're not there yet. Because the moment you all think you've arrived is the moment you're done. You will never stop learning. You've got coaches in here that have been coaching as long as I've been breathing, and they've been in here writing down stuff, taking notes, because you should never stop working on your craft. And this is where we have to be able to support each other. And in a perfect world, if we we're going to throw out that org chart, this would mean like you're allowed to hold him accountable. Now, you do it in a professional and respectful way. This is your coaching staff, so there's going to be vernacular differences between the way you would talk to him and the way you would talk to coach. But everyone holds everyone else accountable. And what I'm willing to bet is you have a coaching staff that is doing their very best to model the behavior that they want to see in you guys. They might not have to expend the physical energy that you all have to do because they don't play. But you better believe they spend just as much time prepping and preparing uh, your scouting report and what you guys are supposed to be doing. They're putting in just as much work during the unseen hours. They just don't have to physically do it on the court. And that's, that's something you guys should be very, very thankful for. But you guys need to all hold each other accountable. And I'm, I mean, I'm not disappearing. I may just come in one time to talk, but I want to make sure that I'm staying in close touch with you guys and I want to get reports on how we're going. Because remember, it's the trajectory that's all that matters. What he just said is, you're not there yet, but we're going in the right direction. That is the best news I could possibly hear. That's all that matters. I don't want to get a report back. Uh, we took a turn for the worse. We're not moving in the right direction. Guys are trying to hold each other accountable, but now they're bickering and fighting and blaming each other and they're in each other's feelings. You can't allow that to happen. Because remember, the two things you want most, to be a pro and to win a national championship, those are the two most important things. And very few people get an opportunity to do either one. And you guys have the talent to do it. Now you just gotta go out and do it. So I do appreciate you guys very much. Thank you.